Let's embrace the past. And in this session, you will see how our past history helps us measure aspects of software development that we haven't been able to measure before. And we will also see how that information helps us prioritize the improvements we need to do to our code. You will see how it helps us get insights into our designs based on how we have actually worked with the code. And you will also see that we are now able to reason about social aspects of software development, things like organizational problems or team productivity bottleneck that shows up in our code. I was once given the advice that when you give a presentation, always start with a motivating example. Because if I do that, you will know why you should listen. You will know why you should care. You will know why this is important. So I went home and thought that if a motivating example is a good thing, more examples must be even better. So today, you will get not only one, but three different examples. And the first example is a personal story. This is about a personal failure, but the interesting thing is I failed by actually improving something. So what happened here, this was a number of years ago, I worked on a fairly large uh, system, and my task at that time was to prioritize the improvements we could do to that system in order to become more pro productive. So the way I approached it at that time was that I used a bunch of different uh, tools that were capable of measuring uh, code complexity. So I took my tools, I threw them at my code base, and out came a prioritized list of the most problematic modules. And the interesting thing was that those tools they pointed to one component in our system, the data access layer. So I went over to the people who I knew had worked on that part, and I asked them, how is that code actually? And they pretty much confirmed the findings my tool did. So they said that, yeah, it, it's a mess to work with. It's uh, quite nasty code, and it's no fun at all. So I thought, great, we have our candidate. So what we did was we took some of our best people, and they spent two months rewriting that whole thing. And after two months, we had a shiny new data access layer. It looked beautiful, and all tests passed. Now, what do you think happened to our productivity? What do you think happened to our quality measured in the number of bugs? Absolutely nothing. There was no difference, and this was quite depressing because it means we not only wasted two months improving something that didn't matter, it also means we missed an opportunity to improve something that could have made a difference. Another related story, this is about another time where I worked with a different client. And this client, they had a fairly old code base had a history that went 15 years back in time. And again, they used a tool that was capable of measuring code complexity. The interesting thing with this tool is that we, it was also able to quantify technical depth. So we actually got a number. So they used that tool on their 15-year-old uh, code base, and the tool reported that on this code base, you have 4,000 years of technical depth. Wow! 4,000 years? Just to put that into perspective, 4,000 years ago, that was when Moses parted the Red Sea. And, I mean, 4,000 years of technical depth, it may well be accurate, but it isn't that helpful. Because where do you start? My final example here, before we try to look at how we can solve these challenges, is taken from Fred Brooks' classic book, The Mythical Man Month. So how many of you have read The Myth Mythical Man Month? So a third of you, approximately. It's one of my favorite books. And the Mythical Man Month is perhaps best known for what we, have to, what we now call Brooke's Law. And Brooke's Law says that adding more manpower to a late project makes it even later. And this is quite interesting, because this is something I've experienced myself several times. In the most dramatic uh, setting, what happened there was that I joined a project and that project originally was scheduled to take one year to complete. They had historic data that showed them that this will take you approximately one year. Now, of course, they decided to, well, let's do this in just three months. So the question is, how do you take something you know takes one year and compress it down to just three months? It's quite easy if you're a manager. 
So what they did was they hired four times as many consultants and threw them at their code base. And yeah, once again, that project proved the Mifkan Man Month to be true because that project didn't take three months to complete. It didn't take one year either. It took more than two years. And one of the reasons was because the developers said that code was really, really hard to understand. And I had inspected the code myself, and I thought that it's actually not that bad. The reason it was hard to understand, that it, this was surprising to me, was because what actually happened was that even if you wrote a piece of code yourself today, three days later, it looked completely different because five other developers had been working on it in the meantime. So they didn't have a technical problem. They had an organizational, social problem of access, communication, and coordination overhead. And when I put together these examples, I really asked myself, why do we, as an industry, keep repeating the same mistakes? Why is it so hard to prioritize the improvements we want to do? Why do we keep violating Brooke's law all the time? And I think one of the main reasons is because when you look at human decision-making, we tend to make decisions around the things that are easily accessible to us, the things we can see. And in the case of uh, a code base, we tend to base our decisions upon this, upon the code. But I will claim that that's incomplete information. And the most important pieces of information are absent. And those two pieces of information are time and social information. And time is important because without a time perspective, we cannot see any trends in that. We don't know how that code evolved. And I think that it's important because how do you know if a design is good? I think a design is good if it supports the kind of changes we want to do to the code. Without a time perspective, we cannot really evaluate that. We can only speculate. And social information is important, too, because if we don't have social information, we don't know if that piece of code is a team productivity bottleneck, where multiple people on different teams need to coordinate their efforts all the time. So I think we need to fix this. And we can fix that by embracing the past. So how do we get information on time and social information? The good news are you all already have all the data you need. We're just not used to think about it that way. I'm talking about our version control history. I've came to view our version control history as a behavioral log of how we as developers have interacted with our code base. And you see an example here from Git. And you see that if we look at that log, we see that we actually have a timeline there because the commits are ordered in time. And interestingly enough, we also get social information because we know precisely which developer that it will change at what point in time. So let's embrace the past and see how it helps us. And my first observation here today, and this is something I learned after many, many years, is that when we talk about code, all code is equal, but some code is more equal than others. And to explain what I mean about that, we need to take a different perspective on code. We need to take an evolutionary view. Here's what that looks like. Please have a look at the following graphs. They all show the same thing. On the x-axis, you have each file in your system, and they are sorted according to the change frequencies. That is, how many commits have you done that touched that particular file. And that's what you see on the y-axis. That's the number of commits. Now, the interesting thing here is that you see that data is from three radically different systems developed by different organizations using completely different technologies. They have different sizes. And of course, they have different lifetime spans as well. But still, you see they all exhibit exactly the same pattern. They show a power law distribution. And this is something I've seen in every single code base that I've analyzed. And I haven't analyzed a few hundred code bases by now. So what this means to you is that in your typical code base, most of your development activity tends to be in a fairly smart part of the code. Most of your code is in the long tail. And that means it's rarely, if ever, touched. And this is important because it gives us a tool to prioritize. So let's have a look at that. <laughs> 
So this is one of the tools I use to prioritize. This is something called a hotspot analysis. And this analysis basically takes the data from the previous slides and shows where it's located in your code. So it identifies the areas of high change frequency. And I'm going to walk you through this visualization. The first thing I want you to focus on, you see those large blue circles there, the ones that are blinking right now? Each one of those represents a folder in your code base. So this means this is a hierarchical visualization that follows the folder structure of your code. It's also interactive, so you can zoom in to the level of detail you're interested in. And if you do that, you will see that each file in your code base is represented as a circle. And you will see they have different size. That's because the size dimension here represents the complexity of the underlying code. So this is something you measure from the code. And you can basically use uh, any complexity metrics that you want, because what they all have in common is that they are equally bad. So I tend to use the simplest possible thing I can. I tend to use just a number of lines of code. But whatever you use, let me tell you about this, that complexity, Complexi complexity alone is never, ever a problem. Complexity is only a problem when you need to deal with it. So that means we need to find out if we really have to work in that code or not. And again, this is something we can mine from our version control system. So we calculate the amount of change to each module based on our version control history. And the interesting thing here is the overlap between those two dimensions. Because now we're able to identify complicated code that we also have to work with often. And that's what I call hotspots in code. So let's return to the visualization I showed you earlier. This is, uh, this is data from a real system. This is the open source uh, application Tomcat, written in Java. So you can identify a number of different hotspots here, right? And we know that those hotspots, they are complicated code that we have to work with often. So how do you use that information? Well, typically, the hotspots make up great targets for refactorings. You can also choose to just do an extra code inspection of the hotspot to see if there's a real problem. Or perhaps you just want to direct extra testing efforts to the hotspot areas. And we're going to look at a number of other ways that hotspots help us. But before I go there, I want to make another observation. I want to claim that code is actually auto-destructive art. So how many of you have heard about the concept of auto-destructive art? Oh, no one. So I actually got to witness that at Tate Modern in London a few weeks ago. This concept is something pioneered by the artist Gustav Metzger. And what you see there, uh, that's his uh, liquid crystal light projections. And they're quite fascinating because when you look at them, they keep changing all the time. So the art looks different tomorrow than it did today. And the interesting thing in is, is in how it changes. Because what happens here is that it necessitates the destruction of an existing form to create a new form. And I will claim that that's exactly how code evolves. And I think hotspots, one of the reasons I love them is that because they make it clear that code is never done. Successful code evolves, and that's a good thing. The reason I say it's auto-destructive is because changes and new features tend to get increasingly more difficult to implement over time. But it doesn't have to be that way. So let's have a deeper look at hotspots and see how they actually help us. So what you see here are examples on hotspot analysis of three different code bases, written in different technologies and of different sizes. And for example, you can see the Mono code base here in the middle. It's really hard to see the details, and that's not my intent either. I just want to show you that even here on the highest level of view, you can spot a number of hotspots. Now remember that those are fairly large, those code bases, right? So Mono is almost 7 million lines of code. So and you see Docker on uh, your right-hand side. It's also half a million lines of code, and you see a cluster of hotspots there, right? How can we use those hotspots? What do they actually mean? Well, let's look at some numbers. And again, this is something I find in virtually every code base that I analyze, that there's a disproportion 
the hotspots tend to bank up a really small part of code, yet most of your development efforts is in that very code. And that means that you can make a huge impact by just improving a small part of your code. All code isn't equal. No, you don't need to consider all those 4,000 years of technical depth. Most of those years doesn't matter at all. They're in the long tail. So what we do with hotspots is basically we identify the parts of the code that you have to work with most of the time, and then we look for an overlap with complexity. And that helps us take those million lines of code and narrow them down to the parts that really matter for your productivity and quality. And the reason I say quality is because hotspots tend to have a very strong correlation to defects. All right. So remember that I told you that code is auto-destructive art. We know that our code will change. And we know that some new requirements, they will invalidate the design decisions that we have done earlier. And we also know that we need to react when that happens. Unfortunately, this is where many organizations fail. And I want to explain why and what we can do about it by talking about something completely different, something called the normalization of deviance. So the normalization of deviance, it's a theory uh, coined by Diane Wagen. And Diane Wagen coined that theory when she investigated the Space Shuttle Challenger accident. So I guess most of you remember the Space Shuttle Challenger. What basically happened was that the Space Shuttle was launched. This was back in 1986. And 71 seconds after launch, the whole thing disintegrated in a large fireball. And What's so interesting with the Diane Wagen's uh, investigation here is that sh she's not an engineer. She's not a rocket science scientist. She's a sociologist. Because she means that the technical failure of Challenger was only a symptom. The real problem was organizational and cultural. So let's look at that and see how that relates to software. First of all, the technical reason uh, this Challenger blew up is something you can see here. Do you see this area here of gray smoke? That's not a good thing. This is the solid rocket booster of the Space Shuttle, and that's a huge booster. So it's made up of several different segments. And it turned out when they started to test that thing in the early 70s, they noted that the joints between those different segments didn't behave as expected. So what they did at that time was they discussed their problem. And they found out that, no, this is not desirable, but it's an acceptable risk. So they moved on. Some years later, they started to fly the space shuttles, and they noticed that the ceiling in that joint, they used an O-ring, so basically a piece of uh, rubber band within that uh, joint seal. They noted that that uh, O-ring got hit by hot gases. And that was really unfortunate, because the O-ring was never, decided, uh, never designed to be hit by hot gases. So again, they discussed the problem and passed it off as an acceptable risk. Later flights showed that that O-ring actually eroded when it was hit by gases. So it actually put them at risk for a leak. Again, they said it's, desir it's not desirable, but let's pass it off as an acceptable risk. And that's the normalization of deviance. Each time you accept a risk, you get a new point of reference the deviation becomes your new normal. And the reason I'm so fascinated by this has nothing to do with space shuttle at all. That's because the normalization of deviance is about people. And we have the normalization of deviance in software development too. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you start to work on your code base and you inherit a file which has 5,000 lines of code. How many of you would be happy with that? Not so many. Looks like I'm the only one here. So 5,000 lines of code, yeah, that's likely to be a mess. Uh, but if you work with that long enough, that will become your new normal. And besides, what difference does a few extra lines of code do? So after a while, you have 6,000 lines of code. And then you have 7,000 lines of code. So what I would suggest that we need is some way of catching the normalization of deviance in our code base. Here's a starting point. This is something I call complexity trends. And complexity trends work like this. 
that you identify the hotspots in your code base. Then you take each of those hotspots and you go through the version control history. And you pull out each historic version of that code and you measure the complexity of that one. And you move on through the version control history, which allows you to plot a trend in time like this. Now, this is real data from a real project. This is from the open source project Mono, where we examine a single hotspot here. And we see that that timeline shows the complexity growth over 14 years. And the interesting thing here is that over several years, that complexity just kept increasing slightly. And then we see that back in 2015, someone made a refactoring. So you see this dip in the complexity curve, right? And after that, it went upwards quite rapidly. So when you talk about the normalization of Deviants, that's one of the reasons that whistleblowers in organizations are so important. And I find that complexity trends are great whistleblowers when it comes to normalization of Deviants in our code base. All right, one more thing related to the time perspective. And uh, those of you who attended Dan North's uh, talks yesterday will recognize this, because this is an idea I actually got from um, participating in one of his sessions. Dan North talks about the uh, software half-life. And Dan's idea is that just as we have decay for physical quantities, we have the same thing in code. And just so I get it right, let me quote Dan on this. This is what Dan actually wrote. Dan says that reducing this half-life means that any code you look at is likely to be either very old or very recent. And he goes on to say that we discover that reasoning about code becomes harder when there's a lot of code in the gray area between the two extremes. So one of the reasons I like this concept is because it ties in so nicely with our human memory work, our long-term memory, right? Because old code that's been stable for a long time allows us to keep stable mental models in our head of how that code works. It's much easier to reason about it. We can reason about it as a whole which is basically a chunk, something that our working memory just loves. And code that's very recent, it's so recent that we remember how it works. So I like this. And I figured when I heard about this that, yeah, this is something, again, that we can actually measure in our code. Because when we embrace our past, we can actually calculate things like code age. So let's have a look at a few examples. This is what a code age map of a large code base looks like. So what you see here is approximately 600,000 lines of uh, Scala and Java code. Unfortunately, I need to keep the name of the code base anonymous. But you see there's, uh, it's quite interesting here because it's exactly the same visualization that I showed you with the hotspots. It shows the hierarchical folder structure of the code. And you see that each file, again, is a circle, but this time the color of that circle indicates its age. So the more dark blue, the more recent the code. And you also see that the, there's kind of some kind of breaking symmetry here, because the right-hand side of the code seems quite young, and the left-hand side of the code is quite old. So what's the most common reason that we manage to stabilize code? The most common reason is because the code is dead, dead as disco. So if I reveal to you that the right-hand side here is called application code, and the left-hand code left-hand side is called test code, you will see that those large uh, light blue circles here that represents old code, that's actually obsolete test data. Test data that's no longer used, which is the reason that they haven't been changed in several years. But we can do even more interesting things with code base, with code age. We can use it to get insights into our designs. So let me show you an example from another code base. Let's look at the development of the programming language Clojure. So this is what Clojure looks like. That's the H map of Clojure. So what I did now was that everyone was interested in all code that's been stable for more than two years. We haven't made a single change. Let's see how that looks. Here we go. Oh, so we see there's actually a whole package that's been stable for more than two years, where we haven't made a single change. Now, uh, Clojure, as you may know, is a dynamic language on the JVM, which means it compiles to bytecode. And this package ASM is responsible for helping out with that. 
So if we look at that code, we see that we have uh, stuff like a uh, class reader or method writer and so on. So to me, this seems to model a different domain, actually. So I thought that perhaps that package would be better off extracted into a library. So before I make a recommendation like that, I always look at the code. So let's do that together. This is what the heading of each of those files look like. It turns out it is already a library. It's just been copy-pasted into Clojure, basically. The reason is probably because there wasn't a good distribution available of the library. But the, I think this kind of reinforces my point that code that changes at different rates tend to model different aspects of the domain. All right, one more example for you. This is from the development of the Python language. And Python is interesting because its history goes 25 years back in time, which means we find a lot of old code inside Python. And what I do in those cases is that I look for packages where the different files change at different rates. And you see one such example here. This is a package called CJK Codex. And you see that some files are much darker blue, so they have been changed recently, and the other ones are quite old. Let's look at what that fi those files actually are. Turns out the stable ones have been stable for more than 10 years, not a single change. Those are mappings. Those are basically encoding pages for languages like Japanese and Chinese. So that's the reason we managed to stabilize them. If we look at the more recent code, we see things like a multibyte codec that has a much higher change frequency and that we have touched over the past month. Now, I would argue that a multibyte codec is a much more general thing. It's much more general than specific language encodings. So what I would suggest in this case is that you actually split that package according to age, because a multibyte codec is a more general concept that's potentially useful in other places as well. So to sum this up, and uh, again, this is an area that I still explore and I still learn a lot here, but my finding so far is that code age is a much underused driver of design. And I've found that there are some recommendations that I try to explore in deeper, and so far I've found that what if we organize our code by age? What if we turn stable packages into libraries? And what if we refactor code that we fail to stabilize? I'm pretty sure that if we follow those recommendations, we end up with a set of advantages. First of all, it will help our long-term memory because we will be able to build those stable mental models. We will be able to turn a library into a chunk for a memory that really fits our head. And since we end up with less code in the code base itself, since we're able to stabilize a lot of it, we also get an easier onboarding because we have less cognitive load as new developers. And I also think that the code edge is something that can help us to decide where we need to write extra tests. And this is interesting because most organizations where I've worked that focuses a lot of test automation, what tends to happen is that after a while, the build takes like forever. So what then happens is that eventually some tests get shut down. And using code age, this is also not a desirable situation, but using code age, you can actually use real data to decide which parts of the test suite that are safe to shut down and which aren't. All right, let's move on to the final section of this presentation. And now, this is something really important that I want to tell you. And this has everything to do with the social side of software development. Because I have found out that organizational problems are often mistaken as technical issues. And again, I think the main reason for this is because social information is invisible in the code. We cannot see it. And still, it's vitally important. So we need to fix this. So let's take a social view of a code base. Here's one approach. So this is something I call fractal figures. And you see an example here from the closure code base. Now, how fractal figures works is that you basically consider each file as a box. And each programmer gets assigned a color. And the more that programmer has contributed to the code, the larger the area of the box. So with fractal figures, we get an excellent communication tool 
Let's add a color legend and see how it works. So let's say we want to contribute to Clojure, and we want to make a contribution to the module over here. That module is called evaluation. And we see that all of that code is written by the light blue programmer. Oh, that's Stuart Holloway. So if we have a question, Stuart can probably guide us through this. And you also see that Clojure in general seems to be written by that dark blue developer, and that's a guy named Rich Hickey. So if we have a question about Clojure in general, well, Rich Hickey probably knows a thing or two about it. But we can do even better than this. Because instead of focusing on individuals, let's use this to investigate teamwork. And this is important. But first, let me ask you, in your day job, how many of you develop software in teams? Most of you, like almost everyone. Great. I also do that. And it's interesting because social psychologists have been studying teamwork for many decades. And one thing that they have found out, and that is consistently repeated in experiments, is that teams constantly underperform. So since all of us work in teams, let's investigate and understand why so we can do something about this. One of the reasons teams underperform is something called process loss. And process loss, that's a concept from social psychology. And it's borrowed from mechanics. So if you think about a mechanical construction, a mechanic machine, just like it cannot operate at 100% efficiency all the time due to things like friction and heat loss, neither can teams. And you see the model of process loss here. You see that to your left, you have a number of individuals, and each one of them has a potential productivity. If you sum that up, you get the whole team's potential productivity. However, that's never ever what you get out of it. You get much less real productivity. Some of that potential is just lost. And that kind of loss depends on the task that you do. When we talk about software development, the typical reasons for process loss is communication and coordination overhead, but also things like motivational losses. So perhaps you're assigned to uh, take uh, care of that uh, legacy service written in VB6, and you're not too excited about it. You have a motivational loss, which influences the whole team. So I think that the trick with process loss is that you can never eliminate it. It's inevitable. It will always be there. The trick is to minimize it. And the first step towards that improvement is to measure and understand how severe your process loss is today. So what I suggest here is that we take that knowledge mining that we did to generate the fractals and group the individuals into teams. So in the following visualizations, you will see that each color now represents a team. And once we do that, we can start to measure a lot of interesting stuff. We can start to measure how well aligned our organization is with Conway's law. So Conway's law, how many of you have heard about it? Almost everyone, right? It has received so much attention over the past years that I always, almost didn't want to mention it at all. But it is an important observation, and it's an important guiding principle. And the interesting thing with Conway's Law, Conway's Law basically says that the way we're organized, that will be reflected in the kind of software structure that we design. And it's usually used to sell the idea of microservices, because with microservices, each team can own their own service, and you minimize the coordination overhead between teams. Now, let me tell you that you don't need to go full microservice in order to benefit from Conway's law. Here's an example from an architecture that built on a, uh, a principle or pattern called package by feature. So you see that each one of those folders here, they represent the code for a complete feature. And you see that this organization is really, really well aligned with Conway's law because each color represents a team, right? So you see there's very little overlap between people on different teams. Now, Conway's law is a great observation, but it's also oversimplification, because it's always a trade-off. If you isolate teams too much, you run the risk of running into process loss in terms of increased conflicts between different teams. So you always need to balance that. But no matter what model you choose, 
I strongly recommend that you measure and see that the reality in your code actually supports the way you work with it. Otherwise, you may end up something like this. So this is a different code base, a real-world case study that, again, I have to keep anonymous. And it's something I call the perils of feature teams. Feature teams are quite popular these days. And again, they can work really, really well if your architecture supports that way of working. If not, you run the risk of ending up here. So what you see here is basically 12 different teams. And if you look at that map, it's really, really hard to find any patterns. Sure, there's one or maybe two modules where it looks like one team has done most of the work. But in most cases, what you see here, it's, it's basically a collective chaos. It's communication breakdown because you consistently need to coordinate the work and actions between 12 different teams in the same parts of the code. And let me tell you, it's not going to end well. And organizations do realize this. And one way they typically address it is by something that is known as the gatekeeper pattern. So the idea with the gatekeeper pattern is basically that all code that you write has to be reviewed and approved by a designated person. And quite often, that person is someone called an architect. And I think that this kind of solves the symptoms, but not the real problem. In addition, you get a number of potential drawbacks. And first of all, this pattern, it reminds me of something. It reminds me of something called Amdahl's Law. So Amdahl's Law has nothing to do with teamwork. It's a, about the theoretical speed-up in parallel computing. So what Amdahl's Law says is that the speed-up of a you know, parallel computing world is limited by the serial part of your program. And I think the ar gatekeeper, architect, it's exactly like that. It's like a global lock upon your organization. And in addition, it isn't really a cross-functional team if you need to depend upon someone else to approve your code. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, at the end. But first, let's look at an alternative that I've seen work much better in real world. This alternative is to use the whole team as a gatekeeper. And the reason I like that is because, first of all, it doesn't rely on an individual. Everyone can make changes everywhere, but the team decides what code that gets approved and not. And second, while it do assigns a clear ownership to a team, it also helps address another issue with the traditional gatekeeper pattern. And this is a social issue. This is something psychologists call diffusion of responsibility. And diffusion of responsibility relates to accidents and emergencies in the real world. So if someone, God forbid, has an emergency, it turns out that the larger any group of bystanders or witnesses, the less likely that any individual will offer their help because they feel less personal responsibility to do so and just assume that someone else will probably help. And we have the same in software. And that means that in software, we must feel that our individual contributions make a difference. And I think it's necessary for good code to have a sense of personal uh, responsibility from everyone involved. So there's really no way around that. Now that we have looked into the social aspects, let's tie them together with our hotspots. So this is what I typically find when I analyze really old code bases. Code bases have been around for 15, 20 years. I tend to find that most of the code is quite stable in terms of development activity. And then you have a number of really strong central hotspots in the most important parts of your code. When I find something like that, I always look back in time. And I see that those hotspots have been around for years, which means we have probably spent a lot of time and effort on code that is less than optimal in quality. So why hasn't anyone improved that code? Do you know the reason why much existing code isn't improved? The reason is because the fractal figures look like this. So that means, no, you cannot just redesign the code because at any given time, you have 30 different developers from different teams that depend upon the code looking at the way it does right now on different branches and things. And this is quite unfortunate. It leaves us in a context that I call immutable design. Now, I'm a functional programmer, but trust me on this one. In this context, there's nothing good at all with immutability. 
And I find it quite ironic that the reason we cannot improve the code is because we have so many people working it in the parallel. And the reason we have to be that many people working it in parallel is because we cannot improve the code. And the first step towards real improvement is to measure and understand that this is an organizational social problem, not a technical one. So please, align your architecture and your organization. Your code is going to thank you for it. So, I'm almost done now. Before I take time for questions, I just want to sum it up for you. So, we have seen that once we embrace our past, we can get a lot of valuable information that help us get a new perspective on your code base. You've seen how Hotspots helps us prioritize the code that is in extra need of refactoring or re other improvements. And we have seen how we can use complexity trends as whistleblowers to avoid the normalization of deviance. And you have seen how we can reason and measure software half-life using code age maps. Finally, we have seen how we can even get insights into how well our architecture fits the way we actually work with it by studying the distribution of teams inside our code. And this is a huge topic, and this presentation has really just scratched the surface. So if you want to read more, I blog about this regularly at adamthornhill.com. You have a number of links here. And of course, if you want to dive deeper into this, you have the whole book about it, Your Code is a Crime Scene. Finally, a thing I'm working on right now, and this is still work in progress, is that I want to provide these tools that I use to do those visualizations as a service. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can sign up at CodeScene.io. It's free. And if you're interested in the tools uh, that I use today, you can have a look at ampere.com, uh, and you will see what's available, and I'm happy to tell you more about it later. So before I take some questions, I just want to take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me, and may the code be with you. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So I think most of the questions, also the questions I had, was where can I download these awesome tools? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we know it. Um, yeah, so that's uh, ampere.com. And the reason I had to write my own tools, ampere is uh, my startup. So uh, when I started to do this stuff five years ago, there were no tools available to do the kind of analysis I wanted to do. So I wrote my own tools, not necessarily because I wanted, but out of necessity. So uh, please have a look at them. And I uh, also have on... Uh, the code scene, I hope it will be available sometime this summer. And uh, as I said, there is going to be a free option on that one. Okay, besides uh, where can I download these tools, um, would you recommend marking, actually, I think it's making, making incremental code changes for this bug fixes to find bug hotspots? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure I understand that question completely, but it's about making small iterative changes. Yeah. I Probably yeah, now when I read it, yeah, would you recommend making incremental yes. code changes? Yeah, so uh, uh, there, there, I think there are actually two questions there. I will do my interpretation of it, and uh, the questioner is free to approach me afterwards. I will be hanging around for the rest of the day. But it's basically, I've done a lot of case studies on this, and what I always find is that the hotspots, they always make up this small part of the code, like 2 to 6% maybe, but they tend to be responsible for lots of the bugs in the code. So if you look at your bugs, they also tend to cluster. Bugs like each other, right? <laughs> so you will see that the hotspots, they are, with, with just the hotspots, it's typically possible to identify the most buggy errors in your code, like 20 to uh, as high as 70% of your defects will be in the hotspots. Any more questions? No. OK. Then, thank you very much. Thanks.